If you're doing anything with language processing, chances are that you need to know and work with embeddings. Uh, embeddings is this concept of representing text and words as, as vectors of numbers that capture their meaning. word to vec is a method that was published in 2013 and was one of the things that helped popularize this idea. In this video, I'll guide you through the illustrated word to vec an article that I, that I wrote uh, explaining the method and uh, how it came to be, and a little bit of the history in, in, in its development. Before we get to the article, two key takeaways uh, I want you to get out of this. First is that this concept of, of representing words as vectors. word to vec is one method of doing them. We now have better ways of doing them, so that concept is more important than knowing exactly how word to vec works. Uh, but going through how word to vec works gives you a little bit of the intuition of how to build an embedding. Uh, scheme, how that training works, um, how massive amounts of text data are used to create these embeddings to make a good embedding vector for, for each word um, in our language or in, a, in the vocabulary that, that we're doing. Since word to vec uh, came around, there, there has been certain uh, developments and, and methods. Uh, the main one since um, this kind of embedding is the concept of contextualized word embeddings. Uh, you can find more about that in my articles and videos on BERT, uh, GPT-2, and those kinds of models. Uh, but without further ado, let's get to the article. So I'm happy to give you a guided tour of this blog post. It's one of the most visited blog posts on my blog, and it's for a fundamental concept. It talks about word embeddings, establishes them, and it talks then about the word to vec algorithm. It's still being used, but the... The concept of embeddings is used way more than just what word to vec does. In more recent transformer models, other NLP models, word embeddings constitute a major part of the model size in terms of, of, of parameters. And there are other aspects where it's not just looking at the embedding of a word, but the embedding of a sentence or a piece of text. But this always also extends to other types of data, uh, kind of like how images can have their own embeddings. People have their own embeddings. And I start here this post by talking about embeddings of people. And the example I give is that your personality um, can be represented in you know these five numbers. You can take the big five personality traits test and it will tell you, okay, from introvert to extrovert, extroversion, let's say introversion to extroversion, you have this score. So out of 100, you're maybe 25 or you're 58 as in this example. In negative emotion, uh, your this score here it's it's fifty conscientiousness agreeableness and openness to 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 experience so this is your scores and then if you take these five numbers that's a kind of embedding for your personality they describe you a little bit and if we only take let's say one of them extroversion and we plot it and we change the score from zero to one to minus one to to positive one. So that's, let's say, one dimension of your personality, literally, uh, but it doesn't really describe you. If we wanted to know more about your personality, we'll add one more, let's say, a trait. And so let's choose another one and we add it to the figure. And then from there, we have this line. And then we also lose the names because this is a thing we have to get used to in embeddings where... Dimensions don't really mean very much, so they're not connected. Each dimension is not necessarily, or at all maybe, connected to a specific axis of meaning. So we have dimensions, and they don't have, we can't point out to exactly what they mean. So where here we had extroversion, here we start saying, okay, this is you know one trait uh, of you. And one of the main ideas of embeddings is that if you represent them as, as vectors or, or as points, you can compare them. So if you have, let's say, this is one vector for somebody's, for let's say, my scores, you can see that we have two other vectors for person one and person two, and we can compare, numerically compare those to me, and we can calculate an actual score of how uh, similar these two vectors are, or these two personalities are. And with that, 
we established sort of some some of the main intuitions of embedding. So one is that a lot of things, even people, can be represented by strings of numbers. The more information you want to pack, the more you want to pack into the the embedding. You need you know a larger size embedding and a some way of um, representing that information. And we get to that a little bit later. And then the second one is that once you have things, items, people, products, words, sentences, paragraphs, or books uh, represented as embeddings, you can compare the embeddings numerically using something like cosine similarity. Um, and then from here, you can build recommender systems, you can do classification, clustering, you can do so much of that. And if you only leave this video with just these two ideas, that is maybe the most important part. Here we try to visualize a little bit of how that looks, how king is, is represented. So these are the numbers that go into this embedding of the word king. And then you can see that the embeddings of men and women have a lot of, let's say, color. So this is a way of, of plotting it to assign color to, to, to the value. But I wouldn't dwell too much on, uh, on this type of visualization. And then we talk about uh, the post goes deeper into language modeling, which is this concept used to be able to train these models. So it's predicting the next word. And we go a little bit deeper into how that works. So we give a model, let's say, two input words, and it has to uh, predict the third one. And from that, we can generate these, these, these embeddings. Word to vec and language models uh, in general are trained on vast amount of text and a lot of that is done using you get this text and you then slide this kind of window and you train the model from examples generated from these these windows uh, that are sliding and then the article goes into this visual of let's say we have this sentence thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a human mind uh, and we're if we're working with let's say a three word window we can slide our window on our for on the first position and that would generate let's say two input words and one output word and then that's one training example that we can use later to train the model and then we can slide the window to the next position and that generates another example um, and then we can go the rest of the way and and, and train the model and then there are a bunch of improvements on how to do this, how to look left and right, this idea of bag of words and, and, and skip gram, and these are two of the main ideas in, in, in word to vec And this concept over, let's say here, of negative sampling and how to make this training a little bit more uh, efficient. And then we also go into the exact matrices and vectors uh, used to, to train a, a word to vec model. A bunch of uh, links uh, at the bottom, and uh, I really enjoyed writing this uh, article as part of a, it's extracted from a talk I've given, I will link it uh, down below at a, at a developers uh, conference, and I used a bunch of these Dune quotes that you know, felt um, connected to the various uh, parts. So I hope you enjoyed this quick guided tour of this guide to uh, word embeddings and uh, word to vec. Uh, there's going to be definitely a lot more talk about embeddings in this channel. Hope you've enjoyed this.